The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14. Visit element14.com forward slash TBHS to learn how a purchase of $100 or more can get you a free subscription to Make Magazine while supplies last. In the year 2000, Ben Heckendorn built his first mod. We can rebuild it. Smaller. Better. Portable. Since then, he has continued his work, helping those in need with creative new projects. Got an idea you'd like to see built? Why not send it to the Ben Heck Show? Hello, and welcome back to the Ben Heck Show. On this episode, we're going to be tackling several different projects. Ever notice that Android phones eat batteries like it's going out of style and there never seems to be a charger around when you need one? Well, I sure have. So the first thing we're going to do is work on some kinetic motion and wind up chargers for those phones. Then it's back to Pinball Wars as my friends and I work on the new game cabinet. Finally, we'll be taking an LCD screen that I have that doesn't work quite right and rebuilding it into something useful. Let's get started, shall we? Okay, for the charger, here's my plan. You can get those uh, little wind-up chargers at Harbor Freight where basically you've got a handle and you go rah, 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 and then there's an LED flashlight. So these things probably have, you know, some sort of simple, you know, power generator inside of them and some circuitry to power the DC diodes of the LEDs. So my thought is maybe we can make it so the back and forth motions of your legs while you're walking around to actually charge up your cell phone, which could also be in your pocket. So what we'll need then is wind up flashlight, Android phone to test on, won't look quite like that, and then one of those micro USB adapters so the juice can go into it. Pretty simple. Here's another cheapy flashlight wind up from Harbor Freight, Yahoo. And on the inside, I think the important thing to look at is when you're generating power is we have a lot of gearing. So you've got your crank and you turn this and this gear turns, then it multiplies into this gear, which multiplies into this gear, which multiplies into this gear, which then goes to the motor. So you've got quite a bit of gearing in there. So one revolution here is quite a few here. Kind of reminds me of that old Antikythera mechanism thing they dug up where they used it to calculate the stars. But uh, yeah, so regardless, if we're gonna use a motor like this, we're gonna need a lot of gearing. So we could probably either copy this out or see what kind of voltage we can get out of this. Now here, um, the circuitry is pretty similar. Instead of four diodes, it's got a rectifier. So you put um, alternating current in here, and then DC comes out that side. So whichever way you turn the crank, you get you know DC. Let's see what we can get out of this little generator. Now we removed the batteries and hooked up the multimeter directly to the rectifier. So we're just going to be seeing what voltage we can get out of it. Hey, you want some butter? Uh, it's not too hard to get five volts out of this. So this might be a better candidate than the first one we tried. Oh, come on, oh yeah! Oh, you can totally jumpstart a car now! In the last example, we saw that it was very easy to get five volts and you could even get up to 13. But of course, that's too much for a USB charge device, which are all five volts. So what we've done here, we attach a Zener diode to the negative pole of the rectifier and then we have a 10 ohm resistor coming from the positive pole and so we're using this to make very simple <clears throat> voltage regulation circuits so this pole here will be ground and this will be positive voltage out let's see what we can get that's pretty easy to get five volts let's try to go past it see even when i crank much faster we can't get much past five volts so our little Voltage regulator circuit, which is incredibly simple, keeps us safe. Well then, let's proceed immediately to attempt charging a USB device. Oh look, it's my HTC Evo phone, which is really awesome and also gets really not so great battery life. 
Okay, so before we hook it up to this charger we put together, we're going to try it in known state. So I've got this um, micro USB plug from my car charger and I'm going to hook it up to my power supply and uh, ensure that the pinout is correct when charging the phone. Power supply is running, it's hooked up to the USB plug and the phone is charging. So we know that works, so let's move on. All right, so I've got the phone hooked up to the charger and I'm also monitoring the voltage using this voltimeter. So let's see what happens. Okay, as you can see the lightning bolt kicked on, so the phone is charging. Now that we know the circuit works, we can shrink it down and fit it inside the case. Going over it once again, the DC motor can go in either direction, so it goes through a rectifier which takes the alternating current and makes it direct current. That way positive and negative will always be the same. This goes through a Zener diode and a 10 ohm resistor which makes a simple voltage regulator. The regulated 5 volt output is then sent to a USB port where you can plug in any device you want. So there's the first part of our proof of concept. We've taken this cheapy Harbor Freight wind-up flashlight, attached a USB port to the top of it, so that you can take your standard charge cable, or really anything I guess, plug it in, plug it into your device, and then if you're ever lost on a desert island, you can wind up your phone and charge it so you can call for help and get rescued. All right. We showed how we can use a cheap Harbor Freight wind-up flashlight to charge your cell phone, but who wants to sit around doing this? We've got the built-in locomotion of your legs when you're walking around conventions. I mean, come on, it's right there. Let's use it or see if it'll work. Do 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 do. Let's see. It's got to be a way to do this. Got my multimeter, my charger, my very high-tech USB plug. All right. I suppose. If I took a piece of wood, taped it to my leg, and taped it to this thing, I could simulate what I'm trying to do. Yes, this makes sense. Yeah. You remember, prototypes are prototypes, not dunotypes. Doesn't matter how bad they look. Well, sometimes it does. I guess that makes sense. Now some people see my work and they're like, wow, Ben, everything you do is so polished and neat and clean. And I'm like, yes, that's the stuff you normally see. Everything else looks like this. It's just whatever works. Oh man, size 32, I gotta go on a diet. Ah, ah. All right. Doesn't sound like it's moving very much. Very minimal. Now let's try this out here. See what kind of flow we're getting. Voltage is not that great. So going back and forth like this doesn't really get us enough charge. You really gotta do something like this. Unless of course we made it into some sort of exercise device. Green technology, rechargeable batteries. With the explosive growth of portable devices in the world today, there's more need than ever for a cheap, efficient way to power them. However, the standard old throwaway batteries of the past, they work, but it's not very good for the environment. In fact, where have all those batteries gone? Landfills, piles and piles of them. Every time you run the batteries dry in your Game Boy, those batteries just end up in a ditch someplace. That's not really the way to go. Element 14 carries a wide variety of batteries in all shapes and sizes for all of your portable project powering needs. Give rechargeable batteries a try. You'll actually save money in the long run, so you'll be saving green and keeping the earth green too. It's win-win. Go for it. We now return to Pinball Wars. For those of you just joining us, Team Heckendorn is locked in a life or death struggle with Jerry Ellsworth to build the coolest custom made pinball machine of all time, again. Today, we'll be building more cabinets and working on a test play field to help us quickly design our shots. In the last episode of our show, we started building the physical cabinets themselves for the Team Heckendorn machines. We also showed how a microcontroller could be used for the brains of the machine, both to take input and to create sound effects. So, uh, ben, I know I'm part of your team, but I have no idea what this is. Oh, yes. This is the Rapid Pinball Prototyping System, or RPPS for short. 
Now, what happens is you've got a blank plate here that has no holes in it, right? And then we've got this polycarbonate thing that goes down over it. What we do is we make little uh, modular pieces of the board, like curves and tracks, and you bolt through this onto the piece. That way you can lay it down onto the board. That way you can move it around and change without drilling your board full of holes. So you can rapidly try new shots with the flippers and the plunger. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, I think it'll work out good. And it'll certainly be the best way to build a pinball machine. No other person in the world would think of this besides Team Heckendorn. A senior member of Team Heckendorn, Mike Adsit, builds a work table for the shop. Haha, <laughs> this is Jones, my minion. I'm training him on using the CNC so my pinball armies can take over the earth. Start the reactor. Mike has done the very important work of hooking up a radio. This is my priority here. Watch and weep. <laughs> we cannot be black plastic frame here that the LCD sits into. We're going to want to retain that, but we'll have to remove it in order to remove the back, which is metal. Now you're definitely going to want to avoid, like I said, don't touch anything you don't have to because this thing will remember your fingerprints better than a PSP and a iPhone put together. I think we can use the black frame here to our advantage. We'll set the screen into it again, like it originally was. And we're going to kind of reassemble some of this backwards. Where'd that red hair come from? Right. Now here's the main piece that distributes the light. Looks like it's been clamped in place. Lovely. Let's see if I can try this up in the screw down here. Come on. There we go. Now yeah, we've snapped it all back into place, and as you can see, it's re-become, re-become <laughs> a solid module. So we can draw this into the computer and make a new frame for it. So then we draw it into the computer. We have uh, one shape here that represents the total size of the assembly, and then we measure how far in the screen actually is, or where the visible pixels are, from the edges, and then we use that to make these boxes here. And then we can use that to draw the inside opening, which is that square I just drew. 11 minutes later, it gets done. And we have the pieces to make our new LCD frame. All right, well, we got the frame cut out. So as you see, it stacks together. We have an inner lip portion, which holds the screen in place. Then there's an outer area, which holds the majority of it. So as you can see, it goes in like this. Fits in there. Okay, so we're gonna attach a little bit of a frame to the back for the electronics so they don't flop around and destroy themselves. Yeah, I should probably um, you know, consult my own design files when I'm putting this together, that way I can make sure I'm doing it right. That looks pretty good. So what that does is it holds this top frame where the electronics are gonna go. Yeah, so the reason we did this is so we can bolt this up out of the way so we can backlight this. 
All right, how to put in the back piece. Oh, I can't believe I did this. All this high-tech machinery, and I'm gonna have to use a saw from like the primitive ages. Jeez. There we go. Remember, the rule of knife. Always cut away from yourself, not towards yourself, for obvious reasons. Now, the wood should be slightly thicker than the LCD frame, so the chances of us squeezing and crushing the glass is fairly low. So now I'm just going to mount the electronics in here. It's not much rhyme or reason, I'm just um, trying to keep it out of the way of the light. Coincidentally, if you wanted to make your own projector of an old LCD. This is pretty much exactly how they do it. They basically strip down the LCD, but they remove all the diffusing because they basically want the bare image to come through. And you move the electronics out of the way, and then you shine a big bright light on it, and then you put it through a lens, and then it projects. Um, I believe, what's it called? The website's Lumen Labs, I believe, where you can think about how to do that. All right. We're ready to test out this amazing contraption. Now, I know what you might be thinking, because I was thinking it too. Ben, why did you just block like a monitor? The new one, 10 times over. But, you know, this is, this is fun, right? All right, so we're using a trouble lamp here to provide the illumination. Ah, yes, yeah, so there's already a lot more light coming through. Hey, you can actually see what's on the screen now. See how it's kind of uh, yellowish? I don't know if that shows up on camera, but that's because it's an incandescent light. If you try one of those curly Q CFLs or compact fluorescent lamp, we might have better luck. Aha! Not only have I saved thousands upon thousands of pounds of plastic recycling the screen, but this is going to save tons of energy. You know, after I used a giant CNC machine to route out wood that I could have cut by hand, there. Okay, well I can play around with it and uh, make it brighter, but as you can see, what was once a useless, unbacklit LCD has now been given new life. It may not look as pretty as it used to, but at least it's not dead. That's all the time we have for today. In our next episode, we'll be working on a portable game system I've been wanting to build for years, the Sega CDX. We'll see you then. The Ben Heck Show is made possible by our sponsors at Element 14. For more information on all my projects and for a list of all the parts I use today, visit element14.com. We'll see you next time.